I hate dust too, because it's just only a running gun. I just think some maps are pretty boring, like Dust 2. My least favorite map is Dust 2. I can't cross to my bomb site without being shot at. Geraint is going to be waiting. Hiko charges in, doesn't check. Oh, what? what? Oh my god! Inhuman reactions! Oh, Frims, Flusher in the back lines. He's out of ammo. <laughs> A knife is out. What's happening? Flusher! He's oh. getting stabbed. He goes down. Oh, no, it's their cheese side where they really struggle. What? Oh. He's trapped behind the box. He gets a shot. He goes for more. He's going to hit it on Dennis. And now it's all about Guardian. Oh, he gets a shot. Oh, my God. For Simple to actually get through this, he's going to throw the AWP in. Oh, my God. Simple, what is happening? They're ready to shoot some ducks as they cross the middle. It's going to be a challenge. And game is not in this lifetime. FNX, the last man alive. He's going to tap the bomb. One shot. Oh, What in the game? He's done it again! As with any sequel, we can't talk about the story of Dust 2 without talking about Dust the First. After being unveiled for the first time in November 1999, DE Dust quickly solidified itself as not only Counter-Strike's most popular map, but the one with the craziest origin story. One November, my little brother went out with my mum into the shops and she asked him, well, but do you want to buy a birthday present for Dave? And he went, yes. And they just happened to pick up Half-Life that, that day. Um, that evening, my mum told, told my little brother Robert to just go and hide it, you know, just ready, ready for his birthday. Uh, instead, he tried to install it on the family PC and play it himself, at which point I found out. Um, and from that evening, I was hooked on Half-Life. And that same evening, I found out the Half-Life came with the World, the World, the Worldcraft uh, mapping tool. Dust wasn't the product of a seasoned map maker or a soon-to-be designer at Valve. It was handcrafted by Dave Johnston, a 16-year-old from Suffolk who discovered a Half-Life mod called Counter-Strike and needed something to do on his summer vacation. You know, the map in me got interested. I started looking on the files and found uh, cstrike.wad, which was a Counter-Strike uh, texture file filled with all these real-life uh, style textures, brickwork, tiles, concrete, all these things that are different to all the Half-Life textures, uh, textures we've been making maps with up until that time. And so I started making my very first Counter-Strike map that evening. And after catching the attention of the game's co-creators with his first map, CS Tire, Dave was given the objective of creating something new that could launch with Counter-Strike's next beta release. Early on when we were developing, the community feedback would basically color our next beta release. There was so much energy at that time and so many fans who really felt like they were part of the development. People were just submitting so much content. We were getting maps, I don't know, maybe a hundred a week. Known for its all too recognizable arches, roadways, and desert aesthetic, Dave's inspiration for DE Dust stemmed from his adolescent obsession with early screenshots of Team Fortress 2 Brotherhood of Arms. Well, they said that they were hooked up with a, a texture artist, which happened to be um, Macman, aka Chris Ashton. And they said, okay, you know, Chris Ashton will help you make, make some textures. What do you want? I told Chris Ashton, okay, I want these Team Fortress 2 screenshots. And so I said, okay, please just make these screenshots. And he did. He made, you know, perfect facsimiles of these screenshots. And I started copying out the first part of this Team Fortress 2 map that I've seen in these screenshots. Um, and that's how Dust was born. Funnily enough, Dave didn't think twice about taking inspiration from Team Fortress since he figured that only a handful of people would ever see his map, never mind load into it. But as we now know, DE Dust was what you'd refer to as an instant classic. In addition to being one of the first maps where the objective was to focus on a bomb plant, players found the layout to be accessible, intuitive, and easy to learn. Within no time, the 24-7 Dust servers were alive and filled to the brim. Come the new year, Valve had acquired Counter-Strike. From that point on, 
Dust had cemented itself as the most popular map in any first-person shooter. So it was only natural that the game's ever-growing community expected a sequel, especially since it quickly became all too clear that Dust wasn't especially suitable for high-level play, a point brought up by the War Owl. But as we all know, Dust isn't really a great layout for a competitive map. It's fundamentally flawed in that respect. Terrorists rush a single, narrow hallway, the only way into the bomb site, and the terrorists don't really have that many options to move around the map. There's no mid-game. Every round plays out nearly the same way. The issue is that, for Dave, producing a second Dust worthy of the name felt like an impossible task. So, in an effort to thwart expectations, he set out to construct Dust 3, his reasoning being that the third installment in a movie franchise is almost always inferior to the first. And with CS 1.1, the world was finally introduced to what will become the most iconic, influential, and ubiquitous FPS map ever made, Dust 2. It didn't take long for Dust 2 to solidify itself as the locus of both casual and competitive action, as it quickly became the go-to stomping grounds in public servers and eventually professional tournaments. Unlike its predecessor, Dust 2's scrappy yet structured layout was both built and balanced around competitive play. Sure, it lent itself to casual, run-of-the-mill rowdiness, but it was also a place where masters could test their mettle. The layout of Dust 2 is its greatest strength. It is what would become defined as the four-square layout. Consider a two-by-two two square grid, where the edges denote the passageways on the map. Now consider the layout of Dust 2. It almost perfectly follows this design, the only anomaly being short A connecting to the bomb site instead of into the side of long A. This layout gives both teams tactical options. The terrorists can use the middle passageways to rotate between the two bomb sites and find an opening and fake out their opponents, and the counter-terrorists can rotate between them to try and be in the right position for when the terrorists decide to push. If either team sees an opening, they can push through to take a positional advantage, or enter up in a firefight to determine who gets to keep that positional advantage. For over a decade, Dust 2 stood as one of the internet's most recognizable hangouts and a literal second home to counter-strikers across the globe. In addition to teaching newcomers the fundamentals, it engendered some of the hypest highlights this fabled franchise has ever seen. And not just in 1.6. The map was given a facelift as part of Counter-Strike Source's release in 2004, and in spite of the game's relative unpopularity as an eSport, Dust's ever-popular successor continued to set the stage for dazzlers everywhere. 2v4, Dragon's in big trouble. Uh, Fragmaster's looking strong. 1v4 now. Scream has a big job on his hands. He gets one onto it instead. He gets another one! That's three! Scream spamming away, Neil doesn't get the defuse and Scream! And now here comes AZK up the catwalk, another nice shot after taking down FCL. Now we're in a one on one versus Dr. Strangelove here. He knows that he is under him. This is going to decide 9-6 or 10-5. AZK coming around the corner and is able to take it. Dr. Strangelove out. So now we are got a 10-5 half. But it wasn't until the wildly anticipated launch of Global Offensive in 2012 that Johnston's masterpiece and Counter-Strike at large could truly be said to have entered the modern era. And what an era it would shape up to be. Geraint is going to be waiting. Hiko charges in, doesn't check. Oh, what? Whoa! Oh my god! Inhuman reactions! Off. In comes Kenny S. Oh my god, oh. Kenny S with three insane kills! 1v2 running up here, P250 out, jumping and shooting, he gets one more kill, looking for it, he's got him hunted down, time is up! Oh my god, Garrett, are you gonna be kidding me? He gets the last kill in! One second left! 
Nitro does have a Molotov and another smoke, so it could be really rough for Simple to actually get through this. He's gonna throw the AWP in. Oh my god! Simple, what is happening? Here's the thing though. As CSGO became more competitive, so too did it become more studied, sophisticated, and strategic. With rosters theory crafting angles, rotations, and executes like never before, a demand arose for maps that rewarded such intricate, tactical play. Best map in CSGO would have to be a toss up between Overpass and Nuke for me. For Nuke at least, um, it's like very tactical and like there's a lot of things that um, go into like actually playing it well. And then for Overpass, there's a lot of space and there's a, it's like also very tactical as well. So it's just like, yeah, just like you can have freedom to do what you want, but at the same time, you have to be smart about it. Dust2, on the other hand, in spite of its immortal status, the map was, well, kind of a shit show. It was open, expansive, was impossible for the CTs to rotate on, and had all but cemented itself as this puggy, snowbally nightmare where cerebral, big-brained Counter-Strike was eschewed in favor of holding down your W key. In fact, it was probably Johnston himself who put it best. If Dust is a map for casual matches, Dust 2 is a map for organized massacres. With a stunning shot, a shot down Olof Meister. It's now a 4v4. JW still alive. Kenny gets a kill on Crims. Flusher in the back lines. He's out of ammo. <laughs> a knife is out. What's happening? Flusher! He's oh. getting stabbed. He goes! Oh, no, he, he drops Flusher! It's going to be a 2v2. No boss land. And there it is. Happy double kill and envy. They take the pistol. It was the one place where pretending you were in a deathmatch server could actually be a very viable strategy. It's time. It's time, James. It's time for Counter-Strike again. But I don't get too attached to it. Oh my god. Okay. All right then. Oh, JW, you see, sir. Oh my god, what? <laughs> James, what's going on? They're all dead. What just happened? What, what just happened? Oh my god. Now, to be fair, that wasn't always a bad thing. Dust2 is, was, and always will be an aimer's paradise, the wild west of Counter-Strike. You can get reverse steamrolled on your own map pick if you're gonna run the risk of Mirage Dust2 because they're so aim-centric maps that if one team just gets hot individually, they will destroy you. And he has been top fragging for a very long time here on Dust2. It's on Shox in a one on three to try and keep it alive. Otherwise, we'll go to a fifth map in the grand files. Shox tabs out one. And that's a deadly kill. Goes for the second and he's moving closer. Looking for the quad clutch here. FNX, the last man alive. He's going to tap the bomb once. Shox. Ah! The issue is that oftentimes it felt as if the map's aim centric structure was a little too abusable. For casuals, this could be both unfriendly and unwelcoming. Dust 2 is somewhat T-side friendly, which is nice, but the worst thing about the map for me is the opera playing middle. Imagine a new player trying CSGO for the first time, and while they're busy looking around the buy menu for what shotgun they want to use, they get spawn killed. Not a great introduction to the game. For competitors, it could be infuriating, exploitative, and sometimes downright stupid. Oh, AWPs, Fnatic, they're ready to shoot some ducks <laughs> as they cross the middle. It's going to be a challenge, and Apex, not in this lifetime. Question is, can they actually get a kill initially? Yes, they oh can. Come on, God. guys. Come on. Unfortunately, the layout had become too mythological to incur any major changes. This was made resoundingly clear early on in 2017 when Dust2 was removed from the active duty pool and given a complete cosmetic makeover. But as 3 Clicks Philip rightly observed, that was just about all it got. All in all, this map is still Dust2 in all the ways that matter, but you may find yourself somewhat disappointed. Besides, Dust2's problem was never the messy corners or the graphics, but rather that it had been played to death, something that a visual overhaul won't fix. Upon the release of what the community termed Dust New, the map was literally afforded its own category in the client. It was slotted back into competitive play in the spring of 2018 and quickly regained its status as the so-called quintessential Counter-Strike map. Look at the start menu. Pardon our dust. Look at what it says below. Perhaps the quintessi in tal. Qu Quinte. Excuse me? Yeah, and what the f 
Last time I checked, I'm a YouTuber, not a quantum physicist. Unlike virtually every other one of Counter-Strike's staple battlegrounds, Dust 2 has never once had a substantial rework. It's remained exactly the same. An immortal, untouchable, inimitable icon. Part of the reason for this is that it doesn't need to be changed. Dust 2 is undeniably a masterclass in map design. Why is Dust 2 still played today? It never gets boring. It gets old, it gets overplayed, it grows mold, but it never gets boring. But the other reason is that it's simply too big to change. Dust 2 is quite literally as old as Counter-Strike itself, a piece of the very soul of this hallowed franchise we all hold so dear. Especially because the CT side is their better side, it's their T side where they really struggle. What?! Oh! Scream! <laughs> and has to immediately fall back with Jade. What? He wants this madness. He's picking what? up behind the lines. He's going to get the kill on Sipnix. Simple. He needs a multi-kill. First found. Twist aggressing. They have to double peek. He's getting his shot. He's oh! hitting another one. Simple. No, Simple. That's unbelievable. What in his name? Number one in the game. He's done it again. It's been replicated in virtually every map maker ever made, and with good reason. Dust 2 has been engendering good, old-fashioned mayhem for nearly 20 years across a variety of titles, most of which aren't even related to Counter-Strike. One more long, one more long. Elevator now. So on plants. Got him! Nice. They're already here, already here. Ramp, ramp, ramp. Got him! I found him! I found him! No, I'm dead! I'm dead. <laughs> I gotta take your boots, Bobby. Why are my boots on the ground? <laughs> Come on. No, no, no. He's it's six seconds. You can get it. Nice. I killed him. I'm getting get it, out. it out. Get it out of there. I got it out. I got it out. <laughs> oh my Did he get you? Whether we like it or not, what was once a 16-year-old's passion project has since evolved into the single most iconic map in the whole of esports. The be-all and end-all of places to bout a bastion of beautiful, belligerent bullshit. Cold Zara is waiting for this push from Street, but he's going to tuck himself into the corner. Cold Zara, though, is a bit of a freak, and I have to imagine he's going to clear this. Oh, no. Oh, God. I love it. Yes! Stewie's got that and the follow-up. Really been playing great, Elige. Him and Stewie both, in fact. Yeah, that is... Oh, how mad are you right now? and twist in the corner, there should be no way out. My God, how has he done it? Picking up a quick triple, and he's gonna win the round, absolutely oh, godlike. Simple, I swear, if you do anything ridiculous now, I am going to- oh, oh, there that's it is. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> no, absolutely not. He made me sound like a gorilla. Dust 2 is not perfect, and it shouldn't be. Because honestly, for as much as we complain, we wouldn't have it any other way. Thanks for watching. If you want more content like this, hit the sub button and ring that notification bell. For unique bite sized videos you won't find anywhere else, hit up our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages.